Hello, this is Michael Fiorentino, and you're listening to Media Renaissance. This is a show where we talk about the past, present, and future of technology, media, communication, getting things out there. I interview some interesting people that have taken on projects across the world, and I speak to them about their specialty. Sometimes we're just having fun, and in every episode, we bring it back to some sort of evolution or technology that happened roughly within the 1300s to 1600s. So the first guest here will be Nuno Moreno. He is the head of community at Startup Portugal, and he used to be the head of community at Startup Lisboa, and he's kind of notorious for being very blunt about the things that he says. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's see what happens. Welcome to the Media Renaissance Show. This is Michael Fiorentino. I'm here with Nuno Moreno, and I know Nuno from his job as the head of community at Startup Lisboa. We're actually in the Startup Lisboa building now on the fourth floor in the Vix Tape office. I think I was here actually before you joined Startup Lisboa yes, by were. a few months. Yes, you were. You were already appointed as one of our most prolific and best DJs in the community when I arrived. <laughs> I was making DJ playlists and video mixes for parties, which is kind of how I got started with Vix Tape anyway. Just the need for background ambiance and I was having a lot of parties in New York City and at gay bars too and clubs and people just wanted some video ambiance. So I started to build a technology product about that and I'm still doing that. <laughs> And we're here with mixed results, but I'm still alive and still kicking. I respect the persistence, Michael. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your background. Yeah, you were head of community at Startup Lisboa. And tell me what you're doing right now. I hate correcting you, but my position was called membership manager. So what I'm doing now is basically like a community manager, but instead of dealing directly with founders themselves and the startups, I work with incubators and accelerators around the country. Country means ports. Uh, we have around 160 incubators, not counting the acceleration programs. Our challenge is exactly to understand who's where, doing what, and how we can help them improve their service. I don't know how much you know about the, the country. We are a very small country. We are about 10 and a half million people. We have 18 regions plus two archipelagos that function a little bit like independent regions to a certain extent. And regarding the incubators themselves, we have uh, incubators like um, house names like Startup Lisboa and Fabricat Startups. But then you have very good incubators in uh, some of the best universities of the country, namely UPTEC in Aveiro as well, uh, IPN in Coimbra, and I just hope nobody gets mad at me for not mentioning everyone. But yes, you have a little bit of everything. So you have Cinsa that actually have a great uh, rooster of mentors, a great support framework for you in terms of partnerships as well and even like the, the also the people from the incubator either with first person experience in building or just like supporting startups we're talking in the context of startups and incubators now right yes so not baby incubators i'm sorry not baby incubators yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, actually there is a lot of health biotech that happens here there are there are well, we have a couple of very interesting clusters with nanotechnology biotechnology but of course they take a little bit more time to develop and for sure it's a little bit more risky than just like some consumer app that just gets like two million in three months out of a pdf and that's all different life cycle definitely a different life cycle different profile of the founders uh, it takes a little bit of learning i spent almost three years here at startup lisboa and to be honest i still have to learn a lot and really try to understand what are the differences and how we can improve our approach to such diversity in the ecosystem. Yeah, so let's focus on incubators in general. So uh, let's assume that the people listening to this have no idea, startups, incubators, their heads start spinning. Startup Lisboa is a good example. It's an incubator that focuses on what? Like what's an incubator? The, an incubator, basically, it's a support organization for startups. Startups that are incubated with an uh, organization like Startup Lisboa have much higher survival rates. It's around 85%. So that's kind of impactful. Basically, an incubator is not just a building, but basically it's a community of not just entrepreneurs, but also accountants, lawyers, uh, cloud providers, a little bit of that people that gather around these founders and try to help them find the answers, find product market fit, getting the first customers, just like 
general guidance and sometimes even a little bit more specific depending on, on the, the specific need. Okay, so you're a, a company, you're a startup, you're new, and it, I guess it is kind of like the baby analogy or maybe a chicken you know, under a heat lamp or a, a seed in a greenhouse. Yeah. Interesting. And in Portuguese, is it incubadora? How do you say it? Incubadores, yeah. Incubadores. Very well, very well. Very well. <laughs> Incubadores. <laughs> I guess I could speak to my experience here. So Yes, so you tell me. An incubator is a way to connect to a community or an industry and to essentially keep your, your burn rate and your costs low as a company while you're in those stages where you're still figuring out a business model. And it is about connections. It is about sometimes it is that legal support or accounting support or a discount to certain services that a larger company can help you with on your behalf. Uh, because if you're a small company and you're paying out of pocket and you're competing with an already successful businesses, it's so hard to survive, just even like legal cost wise. For me, community is very important. Being more established and connected to Portugal. I say about half of my friends here are Portuguese and half are expats. And that's more than other expats here because of the tech scene. That a lot, a lot. We've seen big influx first of founders, then digital nomads. Now we have the expats. So I think it's like different waves, different profiles. Well, but also when you look at businesses, you think a business needs to be profitable by the end of the year or you should shut it down. You know, if you're selling a widget, if you're selling some item, but if you're a startup, you might need years to just be dumb, to make mistakes, to have this error. Um, but I do believe that what really makes the difference and what helps uh, startups like going through that path you were mentioning faster and in a smarter way is exactly like the support system and the services that are created and developed around that. Well, that, speaking of real estate, that is one of the things about Portugal. There's always like an empty palace or like an abandoned warehouse where you could have a rave or a party or an event or we've gone to some Web3 events. I've seen a huge change. I mean, 2017 is when I first started really coming here and my neighborhood, Marvila, was just all dirt and pits and like now it's luxury apartments and beautiful parks along the river. The downtown uh, notorious for getting a lot of foreign investment uh, to just revitalize and the whole place has been a construction zone. Let's change it up a little bit uh, and we should talk about the Renaissance and if you did your homework. <laughs> I, I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> One thing I've noticed is that you're a good host when you're on stage and I've seen you on stage several times. Like we've had the Startup Lisboa demo days. There was a time after the pandemic where we went to um, Casa do Capitão. Casa do Capitão. Uh, th there's been other days where we're showcasing people and you get on stage and it's kind of in between being polished and also just I'm going to say what I think in this moment. <laughs> Would you agree? Uh, I have troubles with scripts. All these routines, you know, whatever they are, just like kind of make me itch a little bit. And on the other hand, I also put myself on the other side. I've seen some really shitty presentations and stuff like this, and I'm not saying it's better. I just like try to adapt it a little bit to my taste. Of course, bearing in mind what kind of audience, what kind of situation, if you have a secretary of state or a, a minister, you need to behave a little bit differently. Uh, I should say there's, there's always a secretary of state or a minister at these events. They love to wear the same kind of suits and shake people's hands. And uh, the president, just he just appears. Marcelo Rebelo? Yeah, if you, it's you close your eyes and you, you clap three times and you're like in, a, in a, an important event with more than 100 people. Legend says that uh, Mr. Marcelo will show up. Marcelo Rebelo de Souza. Marcelo Rebelo de Souza. He's always like swimming and jogging. And yes, like... he became famous during the pandemic because he was wearing a shorts uh, on the supermarket line. There like everybody else. <laughs> and I did shake Antonio Costa, the prime minister's hand at Web Summit. But I had to say, <laughs> you're not going to have this in New York City or United States or, you know, in other countries nearly as much because they, they are passionate about trying to make Portugal do something in the technology space. And I've heard analogies of this to like the history about like, why did Portugal turn from dictatorship in 1974 to for Southern Europe, one of the leading countries that has really bounced back after the, the last recession? Going back, why Portugal? had to resort to discoveries. I think it has a lot to do with geography to, to start with, okay? Like uh, when you think about, just to give a little bit of context, Portugal started as a country with the kid hitting his mother. What? 
Come on, you don't know this. You've been here since <laughs> okay, 2017. So Portugal country since 1150-ish? Uh, I think it's 1143, but I hope my oh. primary teacher is not watching this. Professor Rosari, if you're there, kiss for you. Okay, so um, Iberia was Spain yes. and Portugal, and it was a whole bunch of kingdoms. So you had like León, you had... Uh, Castilla, León, Navarra... Galicia but, was kind of one. Uh, I don't think Galicia was a kingdom by itself. So um, was Portugal like the stubborn kingdom that didn't want to join the rest of them? More or less. The the things are a little bit more complicated than that. You said that uh, what we consider the country of Portugal actually started from the north and made its way down south. Yes. Basically, just to go back into that, came like some dude from France. Uh, Don Henrique, he helped the king a lot, the king of Spain. I think it was uh, of Castilla because there was no Spain back then, one of the kingdoms. The guy liked him so much, he gave the, the daughter to, to marry and have kids and everything, you know? Like, new car, you go. Congratulations. New Thank car, you. but new car was the country. No, lady. Okay. was the, the lady. And because he gave him the lady, he was like, oh, now you need to take care of the lady, you know, very expensive lady. So he gave him like a little county, you know, it was called Condado Portugalense. Okay. And from there, then he dies and just the mother and the son, Dom Afonso Henriques, the guy that like, lost one eye, the one that has the statue in Guimarães, in the north of uh, Portugal. Wait, there's Avenida in Fonte Henrique, which is Henry the Navigator. Yes. But that's not this guy. No, 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 no. Who's this guy? Dom Afonso Henriques. And then... The, of course, the mother was very fond of her father and their family and everything. So she was very okay with uh, staying in part of Spain or Castilla. And Don Fonse Rique said, not on my watch. And they kind of fought. There were a couple of years where it was like kind of some people siding for the mom, other people siding for the son. The fact was that Dom Fonse Rich was the first king of Portugal and he was pretty damn effective. I'm pretty sure he took Lisbon, the current capital of Portugal. He might have been up to Alcácer do Sal. Alcácer do Sal. So if any town in Portugal starts with AL, Alcântara, Alcácer do Sal, those are Muslim usually... Names, yeah. Yeah, that's Arabic translated. As because AL is like the... It's like Algarve is like the drunk English ladies in August or something. That's not literally what Algarve ah, is. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Were you there? You don't know. Maybe you would go to Lagos in the 1,125 and they were like drinking shots and beer from... Well, I, I know that uh, the UK and Portugal have had a sort oldest of maritime... Oldest alliance. It's our oldest uh, ally. And they're friends. Why are they friends? Because they have like common enemies? Usually it starts like that. So when we're focusing on Portugal in the Renaissance era, so right, like Renaissance is mostly known as being Italy and France, but like things happened here too. And there was actually a rapid acceleration. So we're looking at this period of where Portugal was around as a known country that understood itself as being here for probably about 200 years or so. And I guess Spain and Portugal both had extra assets, technology things, which we can talk about. We first started like the discoveries were not really discoveries at first. We were pretty much invading Muslim territory in the northern coast of Africa. We were not very good at it. We were so bad at it that we even lost a king in the middle of the desert. Dom Sebastião. Uh, I, I do think was like the, the mainland was not that rich and we were kind of surrounded by, by Spain. So I think the smarter approach and you didn't have a lot of people here, like population-wise. Still, we don't. Spain had the ability to go to a new land and have so many people that they could kind of take over an area. And Portugal didn't have that. They had to approach other cultures differently. We'll talk about innovations and, and how navigation. Okay. We're going we're gonna to have a little like colonialism moment. Um, quick question, hot take. How do you feel about colonialism? I need to feel guilty, of course. I always say this to Brazilians. Brazilians are always like, oh, where is our gold? Where is our gold? I send them to Mafra. Go to Mafra. Go check that pointless construction there. And it says a lot about like Portuguese investment 
through the ages, I would say. So I went to Mafra in September around Very what we would say Labor Day weekend, and it was beautiful, giant building, and it's not somewhere that you would think that this palace is. It's kind of what I call a Portugal deep cut, like. It's not the hop single. It's not Sintra. It's not the main one that everyone's going to know. You, and you go to Mafra and you're like, what is this place? It's, it's only like a half hour outside Lisbon, but it's gigantic because someone wanted like a summer palace, right? No, it's even dumber than that. You know, I wish it was that, you know, at least there was some purpose, you know, they, they made it like a convent. It was a convent. Um, actually, really fancy convent. An absolute waste of money. We have two Nobel Prizes. One is a little bit arguable, so Egas Muniz, the guy that invented, um, it's not brain surgery. Uh, how do you, when do you take half of the brain of a person? Lobotomy? Yes. F great idea. You have a crazy person. It's not working. You take half of it, half the problem. And now people say, oh, it's not good. Come on. It, this was we like should ask Andrew Huberman with his podcast if that's good. <laughs> Neuroscience. <laughs> Okay, you can argue that. But the second one is not arguable. It's the literature when José Saramago, that wrote Muriel do Convent, where he tells us a version of the story of how Convent Mafra came to life. Saramago has a, a building down the street, and it has, and that's actually Renaissance architecture. It has these diamonds on the outside. It looks like Bowser's Castle, you know, in like Super Mario World with the X's. Yeah. I you you know that building this. down. Casa dos Bicos. Casa dos Bicos. Yeah, there you go. Bicos, the Peaks. Yeah, and somebody told me this story. That in Portugal, there's always like the the cute tourist story, and then like the evil dark colonialism story, and then the real story, which is actually historically accurate but boring. And so the the cute story was that they would have a market there, and they said that there was diamonds there, so people would like chisel the diamond shaped rocks to try to get things because they thought literally someone put diamonds in the building. Did you ever hear that? No, no. I never took one of those tours. Sorry. <laughs> So now there's this building, which it, it, you look at it and you're like, is this futuristic? Is this past? Like, what is it? And the real answer is that the main floor is still preserved from the past or restored. And then they built a few floors above it with these modern windows. But if you go on the ground floor, it's Roman ruins. And you could just walk around. You don't have to pay. If you just say, I'm here to just see the ruins. And then if you pay them like three euros, you could walk upstairs in the very modern part where it has all the poems of Saramago. One friend came to Lisbon and they said, you, there's not really a lot of commemoration of war and violence. Like you just have all these like Praça de Comois to honor a poet. And like, what's with the peace loving here? And I'm like, oh, there was some bloody violence too. But the enduring memory tends to be focused a little bit more on the creators and the artists and the explorers, I guess you could say explorers, which is a, a bit of a bloody topic. Dictators tend to be very good at plastic surgery for history, you know. They try, like, to play down the bad side, they always give the emphasis on the discoverers of the world. A lot of people have some ideas, some clues, but it's not like the main mainstream version that we learn at school because there's also not much information because it's not nice. So living in Portugal, being around Portuguese people, First of all, you're all very well versed in your history to different extents. Generally, there's an opinion about colonialism. I, at least the people I talk to, probably in English, sometimes in Portuguese, there's a sense of regret for colonialism. Just saying, yeah, that was bad. We did that. We were first. We ended it first, but it was bad. Of course, but it's very easy to have this kind of opinion in the 21st century, you know, and especially speaking with other people in public. Uh, Oh, but what you're seeing in practice is that there's still a lot of revivalism um, towards the dictatorship. A lot of people say that this new kind of woke way of talking is like spitting on our grandfather's graves and all these great achievements that we did uh, as such a small country. But of course, you cannot separate the exploitation of the people with all the achievements. But you can say that you did some things good, other things not so not so well. You know, it's, uh, I think I think we still have this kind of idea that it's either black or white. And with history, it's very hard. First of all, history itself, it's not factual. You know, there's this saying that history is written by the winners, and it's true. Okay, it's very easy. Most of the times, history is not as plain and simple as that. Uh, okay, so a couple months ago. 
Somebody had spray painted the, what was it, the statue of Descubrimentos? You know the one in Belay? I, I don't know about the Descubrimentos. It was probably like some phrase like we exploited the world or something like that. But for me, my favorite defacing of a, of a public monument was with Padre Antonio Vieira. Okay, first of all, I love that you have a favorite vandalism. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> We're going to have to look that up and put it in the show notes, I guess. But yeah, uh... Padrão do Descobrimentos. Yeah, Padrão do Descobrimentos, yes. Which looks very old, but it was built, I think, in the 50s, when Portugal did like a, a world exposition, but just for our colonial past. Haha, -ha, here is it. Ah, it was in English. Blindly sailing for money, humanity is drowning in a scarlet sea. It's kind of deep. Ah! Man, when I smoke, I can also spit stuff like this. Well, okay, so somebody was pissed off because uh, there is, there's certain statues that you know, like the Torre de Belen is like really old. Um, That's a real one. It used to be in the middle of the river. And now it's connected to land-ish and it used to be a prison cell and a lighthouse and all these things. And then you have this Descubrimentos monument and it totally has like Vasco da Gama and look at all the indigenous people we're helping, but it is completely brutalist architecture because it was dictator propaganda. Spain and Portugal had dictators during the 1900s, and that's where a lot of the world was having this boom. All the advances that happened, World War One, World War II, weren't really participated in by Spain or Portugal and the advances there. And there was this rapid growth that happened when each of their dictators died. Um, but the issue was that the, 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 the system and the government back then was still pretty strong. And to be honest, people say it was a popular uprising. I would agree to say that in the end it turned out to be a popular uprising, but without any doubt, uh, the revolution happened. It was um, a coup, a military coup, because of course we were dealing, I don't know, I think it was almost 10 years of a colonial war that was absolutely pointless. Where was the war? The war was in all of our ex-colonies. I think the first ones to fall was East Timor. It was taken by the, the Indonesian. Then the second places to fall were the, the cities in India. Because once uh, India gets its independence from the UK, um, basically the Indian Union was like, oh, let's get these cities yeah. as well. Uh, it, it happened by stages. Okay, because what happened was once you have the Indian Union taking over these cities that were under the Portuguese government, many of the affluent people over there, many locals as well, they moved. They wanted to stay within the Portuguese colonial empire. So they moved from there to Mozambique. And eventually when Mozambique got their independence, some of them came to, to Portugal. I, I watched that Netflix show, Gloria, about Gloria de Ribeteja, which is about, it's kind of a Soviet US spy thriller that takes place in... Gloria de Ribeteja. Yeah. Part of what happened was they had people in the 60s or 70s fighting in these wars that they found to be pointless. Why is Portugal trying to hold on to these colonies? And you had people with different thoughts. It was before the revolution. And it, it was showing this perspective, which I think kind of gets glossed over, at least from outsiders that are here. You're hearing about Age of Discoveries. You're hearing about the dictatorship and the decolonialization. What do they teach you in elementary school, middle school, high school? <laughs> so basically, I don't know, but the impression I get is like everything goes very steadily. You know, first occupation of Iberia, all these ancient peoples. You learn about the Phoenicians coming here trades with the Romans, then the, the Christian conquest, you know, and then it's like three years. Okay, this is a little bit of an exa exaggeration, but and then it's like you need to learn or memorize every fucking little spot. I've seen this map. So Portugal didn't really take over countries. They made like little city states all along the edge of they were trading posts. Trading posts. It was not very different from the first steps of the colonization of the North America, you know? Sorry. Yeah, and I should point out that around that same time, it didn't take long to discover the Azores and Madeira. And that was the first one. And then we started looking at the sea. First Madeira, then Azores. 
if you ask them, they will know, you know, because they have their own governments. So well, they were empty too. There was no humans there. No humans. Not that we are aware of. And uh, actually a lot of North American or, or even South American diaspora of Portugal does come from the Azores. I think some from Madeira, but if you're in like Massachusetts or Ontario. New Jersey. Newark, New Jersey. Newark, yeah. yes. You yes. probably have a lot of Tugas there. We have a like kind of, not derogative, you know, it's just funny. Like to the Portuguese descendants in France, we call them Avex. I thought they were luso Francais. Huh? Luso ah. Francais. Yeah, that's the dictionary way of calling them. But what do you call them? Avex. Avex. Like Avex. Like with. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Withies. Yeah, no, it's just Avex. You know, it's like some French word we pick up and we call it that. It really depends because the Portuguese migration, and I don't think it's just the Portuguese. Most of the people are like that, you know. First it goes one, then he invites the cousin, then the neighbor, then the... And when you look at it, it's like little village over there, half them cousins, because you have a lot of Azorians in Canada and the East Coast of the US. But then, for example, Madeira, you have them in Venezuela. So let's talk about uh, the Renaissance and this time period. So <laughs> we did that introduction like five times now. And now, going back to the topic going of this to conversation... Back. So we have this age of discoveries and we have these pieces of technology. So we're going to talk about some of the inventions that led to the age of discoveries that happened around this time period. Ah. We, Nuno is going to talk to us about some of the inventions that he... <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to cut this, please. Come on. This we needs to be this. natural. He Nuno, will cut it. Nuno is going to talk to us about some of the familiar aspects of inventions that happen around the same time as this renaissance period from the portuguese perspective and what he sort of recognizes from high school or from his buddies on the street my buddies on the street they always travel around in a caravel you know it's like <laughs> it's true because well, what's a caravel a caravel so it's a triangular shape vela sail two triangular sails which allow them to travel with winds that were against them. But the thing is like many of these Portuguese inventions, they were just like upgrades from technology that we got from the Muslims because they were already sailing in the north coast of Africa. And basically we adapt them. Was there like a mystery sales school that was like in Sagres or something or? Yeah, that was once we understood that this was a profiting industry, you know. There was this push by Infanto Henrique that created the sales school in, in So South. you guys use a different name. So you say Infant Dom Henrique, yes. right? And we say Henry the Navigator. I, I lived here for almost three years. I kept saying to like the Uber drivers, oh, Infant Dom Henrique. And I was like, wait, that's Henry the Navigator. <laughs> the other one that was a surprise was uh, Ferdinand Magellan. You guys call him Fernão Megalhães. Fernando Magalhães, that's his name. I, but like we 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 don't get that. Dude, life is not civilization. I know that's probably the name they have it there, Henry the Navigator. But no, he had the proper name. And yes, Magellan Magalhães was Portuguese. Okay, but he was a traitor technically. A what? He left and went to the Spanish, and he like sailed for them. Oh come on, he was a businessman. Colombo was also Portuguese, and he worked for the Spanish. I thought he was from Genoa, Italy. That's not true. Okay, this is all for you Italians, you know, all these fake Italians. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this, but Nuno is waving his finger at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the biggest advantage was really to be able to travel with unfavorable winds. So we have some other inventions too. The astrolabe, do you know what that is? Yes, complicated. But it's for you to guide yourself with the stars and the sun. What does it look like? It has like two circles one within each other so it it, it kind of looks like uh i don't know a harry potter device it's a circular thing with a layer of metal on top of it and it's somehow yeah you point to the sun you put it like at the line of the sea and then you know more or less where you are the horizon and that was the other thing because during the age of discovery yes, the portuguese discovered the horizon nobody else knew about the horizon <laughs> so it was a common age of discoveries <laughs> invention to have latitude i think but it was the lines around the earth and saying how close are you to the equator or far away are you from the equator okay so we uh, need to understand that back then they were not certain the earth was round Really? I thought they were. I thought that was like I a, think a myth. it was still under discussion. 
There was always some guy at a bar who was like, otherwise, why would you have Magellan, you know? Why would you have Magalhães? Magalhães' trip was exactly to prove the planet Earth was wrong. I actually watched a four-hour documentary of that and my last plane ride to Portugal from New York. And he had a rough run. He was part of the royal court. He did all these things for Portugal. Portugal wasn't very nice to him. And he went for the Spanish. It's almost like being a, an athlete or a sports person and going to a different team. And he said, I'm going to find Malacca, like Indonesia, and find these clove bushes and go the other way. And he went to Brazil and Argentina, and it was painful because he had to go almost to Antarctica and then be for months just in this boat. And so many people died. And, and he started converting people once he got to Asia, the Philippines. And the Philippines were not very happy. No, he, he was killed there. So yeah, one, t one area was and one was he not. Died. I heard a theory that he allowed himself to die there because he already knew that he failed because he was technically in Portuguese territory because he was sailing for Spain. And that Treaty of Torda, Tordesillas? Tordesillas. 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 How would you say it in Spanish? Tordesillas. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Can you speak Spanish? Un poquito. Anyone that's Portuguese speaks pretty good Spanish. Because... They're not learning Portuguese? A little bit like the Americans around. <laughs> okay, so um, compass. The compass. No, I think that already existed. But it was, this is what I'm reading. It was improved by the Portuguese during the Renaissance, and it was a critical tool for navigation. Uh, thanks, yeah. chat GPT. Tell me more about uh, Vasco da Gama. Very nice guy. Uh, always plays for the first round of beers. I don't know what you want to tell me. Like, he was important. We named the very nice bridge after him. And my favorite mall in Orient. Okay, okay. Nice. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Camões. I like Camões. Uh, I like to pick on Camões. Luis so, de Camões. Yes. So, Luis de Camões. He's probably not the biggest writer because we had Fernando Pessoa afterwards. But, but he was like the first big Portuguese writer. He wrote... Uh, Lusiedas. He did like an epic novel of the discoveries. It was like it was like the greatest hits of the explorers, right? Yeah, it was like the Odyssey, but a proper, very complicated verse, like the Romans used to do and the Greeks. My favorite part about the Lusiedas was that they already had the character that is very common in the in Portuguese culture and Portuguese society, which was Velho do Restelo. Velho do Restelo was the guy that in this novel he was sitting. You know, close to, to Jerónimos, looking the, the boats departing. And he was like, oh, they shouldn't go. It's a waste of time. And look what happened. Now we have Convento de Mafra. So if you come from Praça do Comércio and you're facing the river already, you turn right, you walk for, what, half an hour, 45 minutes, and then you are in Belém. Eh? Or take a scooter. Or take a scooter. But you should walk. It's healthy and it saves the environment. Thank you for that, man. <laughs> okay, so he, what was he doing? He was sitting there. He was just like dissing, not dissing, but not really being very encouraging about this kind of <clears throat> attitude of going and that, like being curious and adventurous and all of that. A couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, I had to record like a teaser clip about what I'm doing as a company. And because you were so involved with Startup Plus Boa, we went to a lot of these offices and said, look, we have like three days to film a video of people doing this use case of interactive video stuff, parties, things like that. And can you help us ask people? And so we, we knocked on doors, we got people to sign up for things. And you ended up being an actor in this video. Like you were uh, sitting at the computer and you were changing the channel even though most of it was green screens and we were like retrofitting it. There was a scene where we were in a party and there was another scene where we were comparing European Portuguese to Brazilian Portuguese. To do that clip it was like showing the differences of like oh let's switch out a language track with a voice command whatever and I thought okay who has a really Brazilian accent. There was someone who was visiting in town. I think they were here in the launch of Lisbon program and she was happy to just read the words for ice cream and train and breakfast and things with the very soft, beautiful Brazilian accent. And I thought, who has a really Portuguese accent? <laughs> so we got you in a room, we said these words, and you're like, comboio, auto carro, café da manhã. No, you were saying, uh, pequeno almoço. <laughs> and so whenever I speak Portuguese, I think, I want to say this with Nuno's accent. I, like, you, you were just talking about Spaniards who have accents. Like, do you have an accent? Like, I... I, I 
I think I do have, but also because, yeah, man, language, it's, it's a tool, you know, and I like to adapt the way I speak, like, to the situation. But if you went to Coimbra, would they say, oh, you're from Lisboa, you're like Alfa Senior or something? Oh, because I have manners, of course. Hey, let's enter this segment where we have Nuno pronounce random words in Portuguese. Uh, Nuno pronounce random words in Portuguese. You need a little... <laughs> so these are, the, there was this thing on, um, I think it was on like Instagram Reels a while ago where people would like hold up a word and have to pronounce it or there was an app. Mm. And I thought, what if this is with Portuguese words that are so messed up sounding from how you would read it to how you would say it. So can you just read through this list of words? So here I go. Little segment called pronounce that word. Here I go. Promoções. Luz. Xabregas. Oh, can I pause here? Xabregas? So that's where the Museum of Azulejo is. And I also go to Arrocha Studios, and I'm going to talk to uh, Gaylord, who's, you know, the head of Web3 over there. Uh, and I do Tai Chi in Xabregas now. Xabregas. No, no, no. Xabregas. Yeah. Xabregas. Yeah. And I think it's not very easy if you were with someone from Coimbra. You would probably learn to pronounce the last S a little bit better. Here in Lisbon, we are a little bit snakes. Wish. Well, yeah, your word for breakfast was, instead of café de manhã, you would say... Que almost. Que almost. Like yeah. the French. Stress time language, I think that's is what they call that. Stubal, preguiçoso, cabeleireiro. Wait, wait, I can't say that one. Say that one again. Cabeleireiro. Cabeleireiro. Cervejeira. Is it cervejaria? Cervejaria. Cervejaria or cervejeira? Cervejaria. Mães. What, what does that mean? Mothers. Guimarães. The birthplace of Portugal. Stubal. Preguiçoso. Do you want me to translate the words? Yeah, tell me, what does that mean? Lazy. Cabeleireiro. Hairdresser. Apaixonar. Fall in love. Espelhar. To mirror. Espelhar. Espelhar. When you have an L and an H. It's a li, li, li. But that means to mirror. To mirror, yes. Okay. Beijinho. People say that a lot. Beijinho. No, you say it. Beijinho. Or you can't say in the plural. Usually when you're saying like, bye, beijinhos. beijinhos. Yeah. yeah, beijinhos. Garrafa. Garrafa. I say garrafa de água fresca a lot. Marquês de Pombal. The guy that reconstructed downtown. Baixa Pombalina. Means downtown. Which we are in right now. Bairro Alto. Príncipe Real. Wow, I'm not saying that right. Príncipe Real. Príncipe Real. It's like someone's hitting me in the middle of it. But it's nice. You have that beautiful tree right there in the middle. I, I think Prince Imperial is great. It's cool. Restauradores. So, restauradores. Restauradores. Yeah, this plaza is to celebrate when we kick the Spanish out the second time. Os Açores. Os Açores. Oh, o arquipélago dos Açores. Portinho da Rábida. Portinho da Rábida. Yes, where you have the wild boars going to the beach. Ribeira da Azenha, because Ribeira means like a river or a small river. Azenha, it's like a place. It's a kind of place. Yeah, I have a park by my apartment that's Ribeirinha Orient. Okay, um, and then last one. Puxar para cima, which Puxar is like a double thing, you know. Puxar, it's already up. Para cima means up as well. Lift so. it up. Yeah, lift it up. Okay. Okay, we're going to go to some rapid-fire fun questions. What, what, what did you go to school for? I studied economics okay. at ISCTE. Institute of Science and Technology. Instituto Superior de Ciências de Trabalho e Empresa. It sounds so much nicer when you say it in Portuguese. It's a nice place. To hear. Oh, um, something I wanted to ask about the CPLP, the Comunidade de Países... Comunidade de Países de Língua Portuguesa, TPLP. It's almost like these ex-colonies, and now a lot of the ex-colonies are... It's the, speak, the Portuguese-speaking countries. But you have hundreds of millions of people in these countries versus Portugal, which is a 10.5 million person area. Yeah. And um, is there anything that sort of Portugal does to connect to the other areas? Because I know that there's a lot of movements kind of geopolitically with this. Uh, we do have a very close cultural connection, especially through the immigrants and their children and yeah it's all of them Cabo Verde or Cape Verde mm -hmm. Guinea-Bissau Angola São Tomé e Príncipe 
Moçambique and you have Brazil which is not an African country but they also speak Portuguese um, and yeah that's I don't yeah I'm not forgetting anyone yeah well I know that like there's web summit that's uh, here in Lisbon and it's going to Rio yes soon. we're sh yeah we're sharing web summit with them we have our business abroad programs uh, it's basically we organized uh, entourage and because we are startup Portugal we have access to to like kind of the political level so we have like meetings with the local politicians and big companies and stuff like this and we also do a little boot camp to kind of prepare people for the the task oh i want to talk about one of your more experimental hosting moments at startup lisboa has done called pitch slam which turned into pint slam can you describe what that is for everyone what the format is oh Pitch Slam was, uh, uh, I think it was once a month. On the first Thursday of, of uh, each month, we would gather at uh, CR7. And so one of the things, it was like a poetry slam, right? It was like, that's pit, Pitch Slam came from the poetry slam. The idea of like improv, you're going up there. It's like kind of a beatnik person going up and doing an impromptu. Because Maria Guimarães was from the arts and she, she was the one that came with that inspiration. But there was no poetry. But it was good because it, it gave people a reason to hold a microphone and stand in front of people. At uh, CR7, uh, an hotel just around Cristiano the corner. Cristiano Ronaldo's hotel that's down the street. Yeah, he lives there uh, in the he, basement. He does not. <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo does not live there, to be clear. You don't know. You don't know. Like... Some people say yes, some people say no. Maybe he has a private room there, always. I would have seen him in the street. Okay, so we would do events there. And basically on the beginning, we were having like random people to come pitch their ideas. But then we understood that most of the people that would come to these events, they were just like looking for the attention and stuff like this. Not that many real good ideas. It was not like... A good investment of time and resources for us yeah. so we went honest about it and just became a happy hour where our founders would gather talk and drink so pitch to pint so you did have more formal things like the demo days and there was one where we had to do a practice run and i remember i had like interns like the mbas from like dublin that were here for a week and i was running and doing things and i had to do a practice mic check and i had to go on stage and give my pitch but it was like a tight minute and a half and to do that i was like oh i have to memorize every word or i'm going to go way over i can't be casual and this the first time i went and i just kind of like messed it up and i was like i know what i'm going to say i have my slides like here's generally what we're going to talk about and miguel Fonch, who's who's the head of startup Leash boa he's now and the, the current secretary of state for labor yes yeah, secretary of state of labor pulled me aside. He's like, you're an English speaker. You should be better at this. And he made me feel awful. I was like, I'm so sorry. And then I went and I really memorized like every word I was going to say. And I went on stage. I had some flashy things to show. And I talked about it. I kept it very tight. And uh, as I got off stage, I was like, I felt pretty good. And I looked at you, who was the host of the event. He said, Michael, what happened? You were so much better and more natural when you did it earlier. And now you sound like a robot. And of course, like only you would say it that blatantly and not worry about how I felt about that. I'm sorry, Michael. No, you don't have to pod. I'm no, saying like... That it's like one of the things I'm trying to adapt as being a grown-up, you know? You need to worry about other people's feelings and pronouns and all of that. Well, it was interesting because I felt like it, it was good and, and I had some good results from it. But then I realized, I'm like, oh, it's not about being completely memorized and saying every single word. Sometimes just let it be loose, which I think is much more your style. And I did remember that lesson and I have carried it on to other presentations. One of the things I keep telling myself like public speaking or like communication in general is being memorable because there's so much bullshit going around you're always like consuming media this media that images music movies tv shows whatever if you're able to get like half a second of that person's attention and like last you did it you did it. It's like you're doing a three minute pitch. And the way just like how human brain works is like you focus on certain specific characteristic and everything else comes around, you know, like a tree. So you need to find like how you're going to impact that person or like reaching out to that person and like make it memorable. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to other questions.
What do you think is legit about Web3 versus what is hype? I do understand the technology. I have a little bit of the idea of the applications. I don't know enough about like specific chains to trust it enough to become like currency. I think it could like in terms of uh, ownership, very effective. For example, with old ID cards and stuff like this, it would make a lot of sense because just by associating a specific picture, every time you check the card, you can go and check on the chain where was the initial like picture or information or anything. It's much harder to, 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 to fake it. I would say that it's a tool, not an end in itself. And I do think that NFTs are the biggest bullshit, like people just. Will AI robots kill us all? And should we be thinking about that differently? Probably like robots will not kill us, hopefully, but just put us in little zoos. Little what? Like the Greek god? No, zoo. Zoo. Oh, like a, like a, a zoo. Like a zoo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're a panda, you know, just eating your bamboo whole day. So we might be like humans that are collected by advanced technology. No, because just imagine what you're trying to max out, okay? And that's the thing about AIs, they are programmed. You put a goal on the machine and the machine relentlessly pursues it. If you're smart enough to program it to make the best out of human life, eventually the AI will be smart enough to understand that what we've been doing for ourselves and to our planet and is not exactly doing that, but maximizing our own profit or certain people's profit. To be honest, when you're now discussing like the minimum basic income, you're already in a little zoo because you have your basic needs addressed. You're like in a safe environment. So you're saying that by having safety, it causes the potential of less creativity or innovation because uh, there's not this like entrepreneurial hustle of having to go out to get things. I think the biggest incentive to, to change is really the need. People need motivations. Nobody wakes up and is like, yes, I'm going to change the world. Like the why, start with the why, Simon Sinek, you know. That's how you really press the juice and, and see what people are made of. Although I do think that there's a lot of people in the world who, uh, because of issues of poverty or scarcity, can't be these amazing creators or designers. Like it, and again, going back to the Renaissance, you had these sort of like wealthy merchant class people supporting artists. And it's like getting a scholarship almost, saying we're creating the safety bubble, now you can create. And then they created amazing things. And there's this contrast of like, if you're let's say a spoiled person that has everything you need, maybe you don't do anything, but maybe you're somebody who has all this creativity and you're stuck just trying to eat that day and then you can't create things. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Michael. And when you look at history, that's why the pace of development has increased so much. When you're worried about having a place to sleep or what are you going to get to fill your stomach, of course, you're going to have a much harder time to focus or to do any productive work in something else. But you could have all the tools and all the conditions in the world. And if you don't have something to like make you move, it will be as good as anything. As we're coming to a close of this podcast, let's talk about your thoughts on the future. Just what do you see and what do you want to see? You're like, if we were to have a, going from a dark ages to a renaissance, but even like further, what, what would that look like? I want to see Ronaldo world champion. I think that's what the country needs. I would like to see more people involved in politics, you know, more di diverse people, not like maybe opening politics for something other than just political parties, you know. Uh, maybe creating a technological framework that enables to more swift processes and more interesting processes like to get people involved. Yeah, like for example, that's one of the applications where I see Web3 playing a, a big role, you know, like elections, voting, all these kind of dumb processes. Identity verification. Yes, stuff like that. But Portugal specifically, are we having flying cars? I don't know. I wish we had less cars, you know? Maybe more trees, less star on the street, more trains. Yeah. I didn't know you were such a big public transport person. I can picture you having like a little car and like driving. I have a license 
and not many people have seen me driving. I would like to have people a little bit more in control of their lives and like with more like critical sense and being open to sometimes hear things that annoy them, but they are smart enough to know that they are grown ups and manage their feelings. Of course, I'm not talking about like bullying or anything, but people stopped arguing. Like, stopped arguing. People don't discuss. Like, r like now, either things are good or are terrible or awesome. The people I like the most is the people I can discuss and not agree with everything. Uh, okay, so you're an environmentalist, pro-transit. <laughs> Dude, I, I recycle. That's what I do, but... Not, we don't know if that actually helps, but... What do you think you're going to be doing when you're 50 years old for work? I don't know. I was never really good with those 10-year plans. Maybe that explains a lot, but... On the ninth grade, the initial plan was to follow something around engineering. Then I got to high school and I was like, yeah. So I was like, mm, I'm a little bit of a generalist. What can I do? So I thought about management, economics. It eventually ended up as economics. And then I was like, fuck, I love university. So why can I not stay here forever? I tried that. It was not a very sustainable plan. And then I started working. I did a lot of shit. I went for, I was a air attendant in Ryanair. Then I came back. While I was on unpaid leave, I worked in a restaurant, uh, a two Michelin star restaurant, but still. Uh, then I was at ICEP, which is like the Portugal agency for exports and foreign trade. I was there for a little bit as well. Then I w started in startups as an office manager. Now I'm community for incubators. So, I don't know, when I'm 50, maybe I have, uh, I don't know, aquatic park or something with whales and dolphins. And a stuff. zoo for humans, for the robots. It, it sounds like a lot of your career was just kind of riding um, the waves and making sort of instinctual decisions of where to go. But while you were doing this, you were generally in interested in the business and economic side, but the startup community happened around you and you kind of found yourself in the middle of it. And community happened in my life. I heard about Startup Lisboa, I liked the project, I really liked the startup environment, so I just wanted to double down on that and look what I am now. Uh, do you think in the future that startups will be, like startups have been so trendy in the past 10 years and that there's almost this backlash against anti-startup people or maybe anti-founders um, in years in the future, do you think it's gonna, the attitude's gonna change? I'm certain it will. The same with the AI people or the Web3 people, you know, like when you just give it enough time, people that stick around are the ones that really matter and are doing it for the right reasons. So like one of the things that kind of pisses me off and I'm part of that problem as well is like, oh, let's create a founders community or a founders WhatsApp. And, and you can see at the beginning it's going very well because it's just founders. And then say, like, oh, let me in, let me in, let me in. And you, you get like the bullshitters. Maybe the community people should also try to create their own communities instead of like trying to grind themselves into the, the founders communities. And I don't think that's healthy for the ecosystem because people like on the beginning, you just like, you follow the hype, you see these cool TV shows. I think startups will never die because the, with the years passing, you have more experience, you have better processes, you have amazing people, not just doing tech, but doing product as a science of its own. And I think this will only become better. And hopefully in 10 or 20 years, we have one third or even less of the incubators we have now, but we have much better incubators. We have professional support systems. I think that's an important part about how you see the startup world evolving and how it always comes back to community and really contribution and people doing it for the right reasons instead of chasing the next thing but also jumping on the next wave when they feel called to without overthinking it we need that otherwise you wouldn't have some altman doing what he's doing now and he seems like a cool guy okay Nuno. well thank you so much for being the first guest on the media renaissance podcast I think we've, we've covered a lot of areas. I actually think we went more into the history of Portugal than I ever thought we would. And you're actually very well versed in it. 
Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure to be here.